So we're recording to excellent. Thank you so very much. Right, okay. Right, can I ask everyone to mute? Um, yeah, excellent. Right, so good evening. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Julius Donko. I'm one of the physiologists in uh, Northampton General Hospital. And I'm moderating um, this evening. Um, and we've got a special speaker, Jared um, Shaw, um, who works at the London Bridge Hospital in London. Um, he's a very experienced EP um, specialist and device specialist. So he has the EP lab there and the CRM um, department as well. So um, he's going to be doing a talk on um, VT, SVT discrimination, I ICD discrimination, um, which um, is going to be really, really useful. Um, so I hope that you pay attention and, and um, listen to how um, devices actually decide on whether something um, diagnosed an in tachyarrhythmia as, uh, as a VT, VF, or SVT. Um, so he's going to go over it and, and, and talk about it. And if you've got any questions, um, I don't know how he's formatted his talk, whether he interjects at any time or you have to wait till he finishes the presentation. I'm sure Jared will let you know, but um, pay attention. And, and this is really, really good. He's gonna, I know he's going to do a really fantastic job um, and that's so, um, so I'm going to pass on to him right now. Um, and and he's going to start, he's going to start the presentation now. So, Jared, I'm just passing over to you. Let's look for Jared now. Yes. Okay. Oh, go on, Jared. I'm good. Jared, let me look. Okay. Where are you? So, uh, make us host. Yeah. Change host. So, over to you, Jared. Thank you, sir. Right. Let me just find what I need. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, we can. Yep. Yes, looks good. That's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Everyone can see my slides. Um, and yeah, everyone can hear cool. me loud and clear. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Julius, for uh, the kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone who's online to uh, participate in tonight's conversation. Um, just to answer Julius's question, I'm very, very open to an open format. So please, let's keep this as interactive as possible. Um, happy for you to jump in at any point, and I'm happy to stop talking and discuss things if I'm not clear. I appreciate there's probably all variety of levels um, on the talk tonight. So. For those who are experts, I apologize in advance, um, but hopefully for those who are new um, and anywhere in between, hopefully you can get something out of tonight's talk. But yeah, as I said, please, let's make this as interactive as possible and um, yeah, jump in whenever you feel like you need to ask a question. So as Julie said, I've been asked to do a talk tonight on uh, ICD discriminators. Um, and it's a, it's a very good topic because it's, you know, it's something that is very, basically the brains of an ICD. And um, so it's something that we should all be kind of aware about and what, how they, how they decision-making tree that it goes down. And before we jump into it though, I think it's important that we understand what the main function of an actual ICD is. It uh, provides four major functions really. It provides backup bratty pacing, just like a, a pacemaker would. So you've always got that bratty pa uh, backup pacing for a patient. Um, it has the ability to detect and discriminate arrhythmias like SVTs and VTs and VFs. It provides anti-tachy pacing or ATP therapy, and it also provides deep fibrillation therapy, which is uh, which is very vital uh, for the whole for the ICD itself. Now, we all know the primary. Well, the primary purpose of any ICD is, is, is twofold. It's, it's to treat deadly rhythms, arrhythmias, but it's also, it's also there to prevent inappropriate therapy. And I think, I think that is so important and, and um, should be recognized. And, the, and to be able to do this, the device 
needs to be able to detect fast arrhythmias. And to be able to do that, it needs to be able to recognize fast ventricular signals. It also needs to be able to see small ventricular signals like VF. Um, for it to be effective, it also needs to know when to detect these fast arrhythmias. Okay, so we don't just want it doing it randomly. We need to have, we need to set it some guidelines. So this is achieved by setting up a, what we call a detection window. Okay, and this is standard common practice and, and should be always done inside the cath lab when you're implanting the ICD. Uh, every individual patient is always going to be different. Okay, so I always teach my students that there's no necessarily right or wrong way to program an ICD. It's got to be very individualized. Um, each patient is going to need different things at different times. So as long as there's, you stick to some guidelines and stick to what you trust and believe in, then I think you shouldn't get it wrong. But when we're setting up these detection windows, basically what we want is the arrhythmia to fall within one of these detection windows for it to begin to detect and discriminate. So if we use, say, a VT, a classic example would be a VT window, oh, sorry, a VT window of anywhere between 170 and 200 beats a minute. Um, it may use a consecutive counter of, say, 18 beats. And it's during that window of 18 beats that the device is using its discriminators and determining what the arrhythmia is. And it's the same with the VF window. It's typically a lot higher uh, in rate because uh, we know VF is quite fast. So I set that up anywhere between 200 okay. and above. And I use the... Use mommy. Oh, sorry, I thought that was a question. Um, and I use typically use a probabilistic counter somewhere in between, say, 30 and 40 beats. Okay. Um, and it's during this kind of magical three to four seconds. This is all happening within this kind of magical three to four second period where the device is discriminating. It's determining uh, whether it's an SVT or a VT that's driving the ventricular rate. And it's deciding whether... Sure. I can take everything we pick from that I get from the car. As to the girls from the boys. Sorry about that. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Hey, Jared, uh, as, Jilas, as host, can you, uh, you can, can you mute? Can you mute all those people? Yeah. Because some of them are not muted. Can you mute them? Yeah. So, so Jared, since you're host, you're going to have to do the muting. Oh, okay, um, you man. Just, yeah, just right click on the person making the noise and then just um, just click mute on that. Roger that. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, it, it's this whole, whole detection window, it, it's, it's, it's a very short period of time. It's three to four seconds, as I said, and the device is trying to discriminate. It's trying to determine what the arrhythmia is, and it's trying to determine what type of therapy it should give, whether it's going to give ATP or shocks. Um, and it usually does this in kind of a well, like a, a three a three way decision tree, and it looks at looks at rates. So first, it looks at is the ventricular rate less than the atrial rate. So another way of saying that maybe is is the atrial rate quicker than the V, and that's very typical for AF atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia. The second branch it may go down is when V is equal to A. So is a one to is there a one to one relationship? Is the rate of the atrium going at the same rate as the ventricle? And that's very common in your sinus tachycardias, your SVTs, your atrial tachycardias with one-to-one -one AV conduction, and even your VTs with VA conduction. And then the third branch is your classic V greater than A. And that's when you have more ventricular, a, uh, more ventricular rate quicker and more of them greater than the A. And that's very common in your VT and VF scenarios. So during all this time, it uses discriminators. Now these aren't these discriminators are not. You know, although I'll, I'll talk them talk about them tonight in kind of individual context. Um, keep in mind that these aren't ever just working alone. One one discriminator isn't just working on its own. Typically, in any ICD, you could have maybe three, four, five, six different discriminators all working at once, working together to try to determine what the arrhythmia may be. So the first one I'm going to look at is rate. And as the name suggests, it, it purely uses rate alone as, a, as its discriminator. Um, and that is, let's use our VT example before of 170 beats a minute. If the rate is greater than that 170, that program zone, then the, then the device declares it a ventricular event and then therapy is enabled. 
So it will then deliver therapy that is programmed. If the rate is indeed less than the program zone, so less than our 170, then the device will essentially ignore it and therapy will be withheld. Now, this is very good, again, on its own. Benefits of this are ideal for patients maybe in complete heart block who are unlikely to have any other related cause for their VTBF other than uh, VT, because if they haven't got any conduction from the atrium to the ventricle, then the only way that their ventricle is going to go quick is through a ventricular arrhythmia. Now, just using rate alone has its negatives though, because if we're just using rate, then it's never going to be able to differentiate between an SVT or VT that is driving the ventricular rate. So in patients with one-to-one -one AV conduction, using rate alone would never be advised. And this, as this can lead to inappropriate therapies. The next one we're going to look at is onset. Um, onset is, again, as the name suggests, it looks at the rate of onset of the ventricular arrhythmia. Okay, So that is, if the rate or the onset is gradual, so like in exercise, for example, then the device believes that it is going to be a sinus rhythm or non-VT, and then therapy is withheld. So you put your running shoes on, you go out for a run, your heart rate's 70 or 80, and then as you gradually exercise, your heart rate's going to increase and increase and increase gradually. And let's say it tickles into that 170 beat per minute, which is with the start of our VT zone. The device will then look at that and determine that that is probably a gradual onset. So again, therapy will be withheld. The other branch is if the rate or the onset is sudden, which you commonly see in attacking cardia. And then that's when the device will believe that if it is a sudden onset, then VT, VF will be determined and then therapy will be enabled. So that would be a classic patient who perhaps sitting on the couch, heart rate of 60 or 70, and then suddenly their heart rate just shoots up to 170 beats per minute. And typically this is usually arrhythmic related. So although it's a little bit blurry, I I uh, apologize for the, the image, but this is kind of a, a, a diagram of kind of how it works. So the device kind of has this rolling four beat and it, it, it changes uh, device to device. So this is just a, a, an explanation of one method of how it works, but it uses a four beat rolling window. So you can see these four beats here, uh, 560 milliseconds, just over hundred beats per minute. And then suddenly the heart rate jumps up to 345 milliseconds. And the device uses an algorithm. So it looks at, and in this particular instance, it's programmed at 81%. So what that means is that the device will look at this sinus rate of 560 milliseconds, work out what 81% of that is. And I did this before, I'm not a genius. It works out to be 450 uh, milliseconds. And that is significantly, 345 is significantly quicker than 450 beats. So the device will determine this was a sudden onset Therefore, determining it probably is likely VT causing this sudden rate, and then we'll give therapy based on that. So the pros for this, these are, you know, onset stability. Onset is it's quite good for those younger patients, perhaps, who may creep into their VT zones during the exercise. You know, there are a lot of unfortunate kids out there that might have ICDs and also have the ability to get their heart rates up quite quick with exercise. So a discriminator like this might be beneficial in that kind of cohort of patients. Um, the negatives is, is that it can lead to delayed therapy uh, in patients that actually go into VT during high intensity exercise. So let's assume that the device discriminates and believes that the tachy is indeed sinus tachycardia, creeps into the VT zone at 170, and then suddenly you get a VT at 175. And it's only a very small increase in rate but it still is VT, but the device won't recognize that sudden increase in rate and still determine it as a gradual onset and therefore therapy may be withheld. So it's something you need to take into consideration when uh, using onset as a discriminator. The next one we're gonna have a look at is stability. Um, so stability, it looks at uh, how stable the ventricular rate is. So that is, if the ventricular rate or the R to R interval is unstable, which is very common in say AF, for example, then the device will uh, discriminate that as AF and withhold therapy. However, if the ventricular rate is stable, which is very common in VT, for example, then 
the device will determine that the rhythm is stable and therefore declare it a VT and then enable therapy and treat if necessary. Now, again, a little kind of a diagram down here on perhaps how it works. Nominally, if I have a program stability, um, I typically put it on at maybe 40 milliseconds. And what that means is, is that if the rate between each of these intervals, so if you look at these individual intervals here, for example, if that rate does not vary any greater than 40 milliseconds, so anywhere between zero and 40 milliseconds, if that beat to beat rate does not change greater than 40 milliseconds, then it will declare it as a stable rhythm. And therefore that favors VT. However, if the rate beat to beat rate varies greater than 40 milliseconds, so 41, 42, 50, 60, 70, whatever it may be, then it will declare that as unstable. And you can see here that on this fourth beat here of 350 milliseconds, oh, apologies, um, the device is going back and looking at each, uh, each three beats prior to that. So you look at the first beat of 380 milliseconds, you compare that to 350, that's a 30 millisecond difference. So that's less than 40 milliseconds. So the device will believe that's stable. Then it looks at the second beat, 370, a difference of, that's a difference of 20. So again, device thinks that's stable, but then it looks at the third beat and we can see there at 400 milliseconds and that's a difference of 50 milliseconds. So as long as one of those three, if it's outside of that stability window, in this instance, it's 50 milliseconds. So it's outside that 40 millisecond window, then the device thinks it's unstable and then we'll declare this a, an AF relator or an unstable rhythm, and therefore will not give therapy based on that. So the pros to this, this is fantastic algorithm, uh, discriminator for patients maybe who you know have AF with RVR, uh, rapid ventricular response, where the VT rate or ventricular rates can go into the VT zone. So it's, it's, it's quite a good uh, discriminator for that cohort of patients. The negatives is it, um, it can lead to inappropriate therapy in patients with AF and rapid ventricular response who present with maybe a stable uh, R to R interval at higher rates. And that's something you do see. I've seen many a time where kind of almost the faster the conduction of the AF into the ventricle, the more the stable the ventricular rate can become. So again, it's something you just need to consider when uh, programming this on. And you also got to look at those patients, maybe your long QT patients who present maybe with more polymorphic VT, where the R to R interval of the VT is very unstable. So having this programmed on in that cohort of patients can be detrimental because it's going to be constantly unstable and the device may discriminate that as unstable arrhythmia and therefore not treat. Um, I personally, and again, here in the UK, I'm not sure what it's like around the world, it may be different in say the US, but um, in Medtronic devices, for example, onset and stability nominally comes programmed off. And I leave it off personally, I never use it um, for the reasons I've just discussed, um, but it is there should you need it. Um, but as I said, it, personally, it's something I, I personally never use as a discriminator. The next one that I certainly do use is, uh, is morphology. This is a fantastic kind of discriminator and kind of kind of simple in a way. It, what it does is it compares the intrinsic sinus rhythm to that of the ventricular EGM during an arrhythmia. And it does that, that's how it discriminates. So try and put that into some context. So during an implant, you put the lead in and then ideally at the end of the implant, you wanna collect a template, like a snapshot of that oh, patient's QRS. And then you wanna do that ideally in sinus rhythm. If the patient does have heart block, for example, um, you can do this under pacing conditions. That's not a problem. Um, as long as you've got that template there, it then uses that template that you've collected and compares that to the template that the device sees when the device goes into a ventricular arrhythmia. Now, if the two ventricular EGMs match, then uh, if, they, if, the two, yeah, if the two ventricular EGMs match as a percentage, then the therapy uh, is withheld, that is therapy is not given. On the flip side, if the two ventricular EGMs do not match, then this, then the device declares this as a VT and then therapy will be enabled. So if we look at the, uh, the diagrams below, um, the illustrations below, sorry, you can see on the first one here, you know, we have a, a tachycardia. 
it's quite a narrow, complex looking tachycardia. Now, when you compare this tachycardia to the template that you collected in clinic or at implant, and then we can see here that we have significantly higher matches. Now, this template threshold here is 70%, okay? So again, this changes uh, from company to company, from device to device, but in this particular device, it's using 70%. So anything greater than 70% declares it a match, meaning that this arrhythmia matches sinus rhythm. Therefore, it's gonna withhold therapy as it thinks it's not ventricular tachycardia. On the flip side, on the bottom here, we've got this broad looking kind of QIRS complex arrhythmia. And again, using our 70% match threshold, we can then compare that to our sinus uh, template. And we can see the numbers there, 18, 19%, 18%, 14%, significantly well below that 70% threshold. So their device declares this as a ventricular arrhythmia and therefore will give therapy. Now it's important to note when, um, as I said, I always personally, well, I always collect the template at implant, first and foremost, you should always do that. But I also like to do it every time I see the patient in clinic. Um, you never know what changes it. The, the template can change with inspiration, expiration, them sitting up, laying down. So I'm always, I, I like to always update that template as much as I possibly can. Some companies and some devices do it automatically. It may do it every eight hours, every day, every few days, whatever it may be. So there is auto update templates also on the devices, but regardless, it's something I personally like to do uh, at implant and uh, in clinic. And that morphology template is collected using a far field EGM. Okay, so there, there are two types of kind of uh, EGMs that the device looks at in an ICD. One is known as the far field, so that RV coil to the can, so over a greater area. And the other one uh, is where most of the decision making of an ICD is, is using the near field EGM, and that's your kind of RV tip to RV ring. And that's the crux of the, the sensing, and that's where the device senses over that very small area. Um, so just to keep that in mind, that when you are collecting the template, that it is going to kind of use a far field EGM to collect that template, despite the device using the near field EGM to, to make its decisions. So the next one. Um, hey, um, hey. Really quick, do you mind if I jump in? Please do, man. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Jared. Hey, this is AJ. Um, so I can really only speak more to the Abbott side of things, but I will tell you, um, you know, just in general, when you have morphology, um, it can be tricked by aberrancy. So those are things yes. to keep in mind as well as even though these other algorithms can be all be tricked, um, morphology is quite frequently a tricked by aberrancy when you have those cases. So um, unfortunately, you really can't always measure that in clinic. Sometimes you can try pacing at a higher rate and see if you can mm -hmm. get that aberrant conduction. So and just to kind of clarify for the group, um, in previous lectures, we talked about the electrical circuit of the heart and what can happen is at higher rates, certain pieces of that electrical circuit will not accept um, the pulse through the normal system. So you may have like a bundle branch block essentially occur and it can change the way that the EKG, um, when you're looking at it from an outward perspective and the EGM from what the device sees, um, the way that electrical current is interpreted and when it looks at morphology, it could very well be a conducted flutter or a fast sinus rate, whatever it is, but the morphology changes completely. The device interprets it as a VT and goes to therapy instead. So just to keep in mind, it, it doesn't work for every patient. It works for a lot of them though. Yeah, that's great. That's great input, AJ. And um, yeah, and just to continue on with that, it's, but yeah, you may get an atrial tachycardia that gives you a right bundle, but even on the flip side, you may, and I, I've seen it personally where you may get a, some kind of like a fascicular VT that's using the mm. branches to, to uh, as part of the circuit, which may, if it's going down those bundle branches, then you're going to get a nice narrow looking QRS VT. And then that QRS could match your sinus uh, template. Therefore therapy may be disabled. Uh, yeah. Withheld based on that algorithm. So again, like anything you take it with a pinch of salt, um, and as I said, right at the start, there's kind of no right or wrong of, but you've just got to always, you almost got to be smarter than the ICD sometimes. And you got to, you know, in a, in a weird way, they're quite you know, as, as sophisticated as they are. They're all quite, very quite simple in their thinking as well. And um, 
so yeah just another thing to consider when uh when you are doing that so the next one we're going to look at is um is noise detection and this is a uh, you know i've seen i've seen this save a lot of people from getting inappropriate therapies over my time and this is something that i know um, and I'm sure AJ can back me up on this, is something that Abbott, I think, do very well in their ICDs. Um, what it does is the RV lead noise discriminator algorithm, it, it differentiates RV lead noise from, from VT and VF. And what that does, it, it does that by looking at the far field EGM and the near field EGM. And as we mentioned before, that far field EGM is measured from the RV tip of the lead to the, uh, the near field, sorry, is from the RV tip to the RV ring. And that far field EGM is from the RV coil to can, so over a greater area. And it compares those two. So if the fast ventricular signals are detected on the near field EGM, so you know the eyes of the ICD, but not detected on the far field EGM, then therapy is withheld. It believes that the device is, the, no, the, the arrhythmia is caused by noise. On the flip side, if the ventricular signals are detected on both the near field and the far field EGM, then therapy is enabled as the device believes this to be a VT um, arrhythmia. And you can see this in a nice, again, a nice diagram uh, represents that here beautifully. And you can see here that this top channel here showing all these chaotic signals is in fact that, that this is the near field EGM. So this is, that, this is the tip to ring EGM. And this is what the device uses to determine um, what what if it's going to treat or determine what the arrhythmia is it uses that near field egm here but you can see here on the far field egm it's a very clear okay and you can see just qrs is marching through very nicely here so there's a discrepancy between the near field and the far field and as we said before if there is a discrepancy between the two then the device will determine that as noise and withhold therapy as we're on the bottom here we can see again very fast chaotic signals uh, on the near field EGM, but we also represent them here on the far field EGM, okay? And as the device says, if it, when the device is comparing the two, if they're the same on both the near field and the far field, then the device will deem this to be a ventricular arrhythmia and will go on and give therapy. The other one uh, we're gonna move on to next is, what is it, timeout. So, uh, Timeout's a tricky one. And I know, again, AJ can maybe uh, chime in here, but it, it's something that I, certainly it's not used in the UK. Um, it's something I personally never use. I, it's one of the first things I turn off. Um, it comes nominally on in, in devices, um, that some of the devices that I know of, um, but it's something that's the first, it's one of the first things that I turn off. And how it works is timeout, it allows the device to essentially override the decision making of the ICD. Okay, so it, and there are two types. You've got an RV lead noise timeout, which is again, that RV lead noise algorithm that we just spoke about, but it also has this high rate timeout. And they're the two most common uh, timeout algorithms that it uses. It is programmable, um, the timeout. Um, it, it's a time, it's a period of time. It's usually set to around 45 seconds. Uh, it is programmable. You can you can extend it out to a minute, two minutes, three minutes, or you can shorten it to a few to thirty seconds if you want to. Or like I do, you can turn it off. Now, what it does in let's use the we'll look at the RV lead noise timeout first. So, once timeout is reached, uh, detection will resume and therapies will no longer be withheld for noise discrimination. So, what does that actually mean? So, if we go back and look here. Okay, let's use this as our example. If the device detects a ventricular arrhythmia as noise, so it's appropriately detected to say, you know what, this is noise. The two EGMs don't match. I believe this to be noise. Okay, and that's great. And that's what we want the IC to do. To do. However, the timeout algorithm comes in and it wants to play ball. So it's like, well, you're programmed to set me up for 45 seconds. So what happens is after 45 seconds, if that ICD is still detecting noise or detecting something on the ventricular channel in the VT zone or the VF zone, it will deliver therapy regardless of what the rhythm is. So you can see the downside already. And that's very similar to the high rate timeout. 
Okay, now once timeout is reached here, the device will override any SVT discriminator and deliver therapy for any arrhythmia that continues beyond a programmed length of time. So again, what does all that mean? So that means that if someone goes into a SVT, for example, or an atrial tachycardia with one-to-one -one conduction, whatever it may be, the device will hopefully discriminate that appropriately. It will then decide that it's an SVT in origin and not ventricular in origin. It will then go therapy is not warranted here and we'll keep uh we'll just keep uh looking at the arrhythmia to see what happens but again after a certain programmed amount of time say 45 seconds if that arrhythmia that svt is still continuing in your vp zone the device will then override it again and regardless of what the rhythm is will give therapy so again essentially leading to what we believe is an inappropriate shock so now, despite me not using it, and uh, I know a lot of centers out there don't, that does have some pros, okay? It, it can deliver life-saving therapy in the event an ICD actually does get it wrong. Uh, it may discriminate uh, incorrectly. It may discriminate noise or an SVT when in fact it truly is VT. Um, but on the flip side, again, you've got to be careful and, and use this wisely with your different types of patients. It can provide treatment for those patients who perhaps have fast conducted AF or fast arrhythmias, SVTs, that make them hemodynamically compromised. So there may be a cause that you go, you know what, we need to treat this regardless of what the arrhythmia is, whether it's atrial or ventricular driven, um, we, need to, we need to do this. But again, for me, the cons, the, the, the cons outweigh the pros and we know the cons that it can lead to inappropriate therapy. And we know one of our primary goals always in ICDs is to prevent inappropriate therapy. So. It's just something you've got to be considered about. And if you ever look at it, you can see it here on a, uh, this is on a Medtronic uh, ICD. You can see RV lead noise, it's on with timeout, okay? And that timeout is set to 0.75, which 45 seconds. And then on the other one, you've got the high rate timeout, okay? Where you can have it in your VF zone or your all your zone. So if you believe that, oh, uh, see if I can mute that. Um, well, while he's working on muting, um, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. We don't typically use timeout in the U.S., at least from my experience in the, the two cities that I've worked um, and the training that I've had across the country. But um, in the instances we do use it, it may be when we have a faster VT1 zone, VT2 zone, whichever, and then a higher VF zone. So if you have like a VF at 240 and a VT from 200 to 240, you may have a timeout on the off chance that you still want to give therapy before it escalates too fast. Sure. Um, but normally we do the made at RIT 171 monitor, 200 VF. So there, it doesn't play a role at all because you don't even have discriminators. You just say, go straight to shock at 200 and then below 171. We're just looking for our 2171. We're looking for any kind of event that could occur. We may need to program for. Yeah. Fantastic, mate. Thank you. Good input. So the final algorithm we're going to look at tonight is uh, the T-Wave algorithm, the T-Wave discriminator. And uh, it's kind of in the name, but the idea here is that it's an algorithm designed to reduce inappropriate therapy uh, by over-sensing the T-Wave. So we know an ICD works by sensing the R-Waves, the kind of the QRS almost of the ECG, but it looks at the R-Wave. Now, unfortunately, if you suddenly sense the R wave and then you also sense the T wave, you can see there suddenly we're going to have what we call this kind of double counting, a sensing on the R wave and a sensing on the T wave, which is never ideal because if you time between the R wave and the T wave, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a lot of time there. We're talking maybe a few hundred milliseconds. So that quite easily would fall into your VF zones quite comfortably. And then naturally, as the patient's heart rate goes up, their R to R intervals get shorter. So their R to T intervals, R wave and T wave interval will get shorter. And then again, this will make things even worse and certainly put you into the VF zone if you're also counting your T wave. So again, this is something that I think Abbott do fantastically well in their ICDs, um, the way they, they the way their, their discriminated works. Um, it works almost like this beat to beat um, algorithm where it looks at each beat and, um, and we'll have a look at that briefly. But the thing about with these algorithms, as good as they are um, at, at discriminating T-wave over sensing, the underlying issue is that 
even though they are discriminating it, great, but you can't leave the patient like that. It doesn't eliminate T-wave oversensing. Um, in some cases it can, certainly in the Abbott, uh, in the Abbott uh, devices. So you need to do kind of further testing. You need to get your patients into clinic. You need to do an RV sensing test and, and see what's going on with the R wave. Um, you may want to change the sensing configuration. Uh, typically on an ICD, it's, it's usually that near field, it's tip to ring. You may want to maybe change it to tip to coil. So you can maybe want to have a change at how the device is looking. Um, you may want to adjust the sensitivity. So you might want to make this, the device less sensitive. So you almost want to kind of just make it see less. Um, but, I've, you know, I've got to hit home that, you know, if you make any of these changes to RV sensing, that it's always got to be done with cautious caution. Because if you start playing around with the way the device senses or if you want to try and make it less sensitive, then you run the risk of maybe under sensing VF when it truly does come. Now, back in the day, and I know, I think AJ touched on it last week, I believe, is that, you know, back in the day, we always used to do DFTs during an implant. We would set the device up to be as least sensitive as possible. We would give it the most smaller shock possible, and we would test it under its worst possible conditions. And we knew if that was successful, we knew that when we did program it properly, we we're pretty confident that um, the device was going to uh, behave appropriately. But this day and age, we don't seem to do that a lot. So you've just got to take any changes you do with caution um, and just to make sure that, although it is nice to you know, get rid of T-wave oversensing, uh, you may do it the detriment of undersensing VF. So again, just, just be aware of that. Um, and we see it here in this beautiful diagram. AJ sent this across to me. Um, and it's the way the Abbott one that works. And as I said, I think it's fantastic. It is programmable, which is what I do like about it. Some of the other ICDs, other companies out there, T -Wave, uh, the T-Way algorithm is non-programmable. So whatever it's set with, that's, that, that's it. That's, you've just got to work with that. Um, now it works on, I believe, a beat to beat. I mean, AJ's going to know this tenfold better than I do, but um, it works on almost like a beat to beat kind of thing. It, so the first thing, if we use it here, it it looks at what the R wave is. Okay, it looks for the peak of the R wave, and in this example, it's seven millivolts. So it's a nice, decent R wave. And then the way the algorithm works is it again, I believe it's programmable. It, it looks at it then works out what is fifty percent of that R wave. Okay and it reduces the sensitivity down to 50% of that R wave. So three and a half millivolts in this example. Oh, then, uh, sorry, just a, sorry to jump in. Just to no, please do, it's mate. a little confusing. It says, uh, it says three millivolts. Oh, yeah, uh, and the reason being, the highest it'll ever take is six millivolts. Uh, okay. And that's just because, it, so basically it rectifies the signal to get it all positive and takes the, the peak, which um, if it's anything over six, it just treats it at six. Gotcha. Um, and the reason being, because you, you see that decrement down, if it was for some reason like a uh, 12 millivolt R wave, then we'd be starting at six millivolts and it would yes. take so long to get down to max sensitivity. Exactly. We'd miss stuff. Yeah. 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 So, but sorry, go on. You're, you're absolutely spot on. No, I did say that. I wasn't sure if it was a typo or not. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's weird. And it, it didn't specify it. And I was like, I just saw that. I'm like, oh, that's confusing right now. No, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, and that's good insight. And that's really nice to know. But um, yeah, so based on that, we know that then the device kind of rectifies it to 50% of the peak R wave. So in this instance, let's use three. It then provides a, a delay, okay? It divides a delay in this instance, 60 milliseconds. So after it senses, it's gonna keep the sensitivity at three millivolts for 60 milliseconds. And at that point, it will then begin to decay down, okay? Gradually getting smaller and smaller with the sensitivity until it senses again, the R wave, and this at your max sensitivity, which typically in an ICD could be around 0.9 millivolts programmed. It then rectifies the signal again, looks for the peak R wave of that signal. And this now next beat is four millivolts. So you can see it's constantly changing. It could be respiration. It could be movement, uh, postural changes. So this is why it's such a good thing that it is works on a beat to beat. And in this instance, so it's four millivolts. Again, it drops the sensitivity to 50% of that peak of that R wave. So that is now two millivolts. It again provides a delay and then it begins to decay down again until it senses the next T wave. Now, the idea behind this is that somewhere kind of under this pink line here is gonna be your T wave, okay? That's the whole idea. 
And if it's under all of this pink stuff, it means that it's not going to be sensed. If you suddenly find that your T wave is poking out over here in this P wave, in this uh, above the pink line, then as the device begins to decay, it may pick up signal say here, which is the T wave. And then it will think that that's the R wave. And then again, it'll be, it'll start this whole process again. But the point is, is that if it's sensing very early, it's going to think that it's a rapid ventricular rate and could lead to, could lead to uh, the therapy. So um, this is why, again, this is really, really good example of uh, kind of Abbott doing good, good things and the way it, way it does uh, its T wave over sensing algorithm. Do you mind if I jump in real quick? Sure, go for it, man. Yeah, so um, I think that was a perfect example of, say, for example, they, they get tall T waves. In those cases, you would reach out to uh, one of us to help, you know, customize the programming. And we could actually raise, in this case, the threshold start to 75%, which will raise that pink line. And then it will hopefully miss the T wave. Or, for example, if the T wave is later, you may customize the decay delay to try to delay longer for a shorter T wave that's later in the, in the process. So you can kind of customize where that pink line decrements down hmm. to try to miss any kind of T wave. So it's very, it's highly customizable there. But I think you made a really good point um, earlier when you said, you know, you have to be aware of any kind of changes you make because that can affect the patient getting therapy down the road. So if you see a case where a patient had T wave oversensing at one occurrence at one period of time, um, because maybe they had a long QT, it could be during that period of time that their, you know, electrolytes are out of whack or, were, you know, uh, out, not ideal. So in those cases, making a long-term change for what could have been just a short-term event can affect their ability to get therapy long-term. So I think that that kind of plays into your whole idea of like, you have to look at the patient, you have to look at the substrate and the universal you know, decision-making process, not just focusing on one instance, but how it's going to give therapy over time as well. Yeah, perfect, mate. That's great input. Thank you. So you can see, again, uh, this is maybe something you may see in clinic that pop up, uh, a little dot plot here of, uh, of classic kind of T-wave over sensing. It's, it's commonly known as what we call the, the railway tracks. Um, and you almost have these kind of, little pink dots representing two separate lines, one being the R wave and the other one being the T wave. And you kind of have these dots almost on top of each other, almost looking like a set of railway tracks. So if you do ever see this double counting on your dot plot, um, you should be highly suspicious of T wave over sensing. But again, hopefully with all the very clever discriminators out there, you, um, you may see this, but it may uh, detected and you can see here that this is all being detected as T wave over sensing. So therapy was uh, withheld here in this instance. So yeah, keep an eye out for those classic railway tracks uh, with double counting. So that's, that's discriminators. So, you know, we've, it's taken me half an hour to, to, to discuss all of that, but as I said, this is all, all of those discriminators are happening within a few seconds of uh, when the device picks up. Uh, detects an arrhythmia within that detection window and after all of that it then now needs to make it it's got its own decisions to make you know is this an svt at which point i'm not going to give any therapy or is this a vt or vf and i need to actually go down the decision tree of now okay giving actual therapy and treating these arrhythmias and like any for icd to be as effective as it, it needs to be able to treat these arrhythmias and it, it can do it in two ways it can use uh atp so anti-tachy pacing, or it can, as we did, as, as we know with an ICD, it can deliver shocks. Now, typically with any programming, usually the first line of defense is always going to be some form of, uh, of ATP. You want to try and, again, our primary goal here in any ICD is trying to prevent patients getting shocks. We know, out, know long-term outcomes are, are reduced, it increases hospital stays, increases mortality. Um, so... Wherever we can prevent shocks, that's that's our primary goal as physiologists and physicians. Um, so we always want to try and, you know, if we can pace them out of it before they get shocked out of it, then that, and that's perfect. And that's something that ATP generally does pretty well. Um, and a ATP is basically the pacing, the pacemaker or the IC, the lead of the ICD delivering overdrive pacing. So if we had a, a VT, for example, of let's say 300 milliseconds, what the device does is typically it's programmed around 85%. So 
the device will work out what 85% of the tachycardia is. So in this instance, 85% of 300 is approximately 260 milliseconds. So it will provide pacing at 260 milliseconds and try and get the patient out of that arrhythmia. For a typical kind of episode or a zone, like in a VT zone, for example, uh, you typically, I personally would typically give up to six bursts of ATP in a given episode. That's how I program it. Um, after that, it then if that fails, then we'll move on to shocks. And a standard shock in most devices will be anywhere between 30 to 40 joules. Uh, and you can give up to six shocks an episode um, at any given episode. So after the sixth shock, unfortunately, that is exhausted and there'll be no more therapy after that. So if we look at ATP in isolation, there are, there are two kind of common types of ATP. And uh, I know AJ touched on a little bit this last week, and I just thought I'd go into a little bit uh, more tonight. Uh, is There's two types. There's, there's the burst. And a burst of ATP is given at a programmed number of pulses. Typically, that could be anywhere between 8, 10, 12, whatever you want it to be. And it's given at a specific rate. And again, programmable, but typically around maybe 85% of the cycle length. And each pulse in a burst is given at the same calculated rate, okay? So if we use the example here, so we have a VT of 350 milliseconds. It, it here's programmed at say 91%. So the device works out what 91% of the ventricular arrhythmia is, works out to be under 320 milliseconds, and it will give eight or nine, whatever, one, two, three, four, seven pulses of, VT, of ATP here at 320 milliseconds. So it's a fixed rate given at a, a number of intervals here at say seven. Now, if the VT continues, the device then redetects. What that means is that it looks at what the new ventricular rate is. Maybe it's changed, maybe it's gotten quicker. So that 320 milliseconds that it gave before might not be sufficient anymore. Um, it might have to pace quicker. It might be too quick. It might have to pace a little bit slower. Who knows? So it does this thing called redetection. Uh, but in this example, again, the tachycardia continues on at 350 milliseconds. The device then works out again what 350 milliseconds is. But this time, it, it's so it's 320. But this time, you'll, I typically program a decremental of 10 milliseconds. So even though it should give it at 320, it's actually going to give it a 10 milliseconds quicker at seven pulses. Remember, each pulse is identically the same here, as you can see. And that'll give therapy that way. Uh, it'll give it in that sequence. The way I always program my devices is that I'm always trying to get progressively more aggressive. Um, I don't see the point of giving six bursts of ATP of the exact same thing. Um, it, to me, it's pointless. If the first couple of bursts don't work, then why is burst three, four, five, or six gonna work? You've gotta try something different because um, the ultimate outcome is going to be shocks anyway. So you may as well try and give the patient the best opportunity to come out of it. So, so here we're getting a little bit aggressive between the two. So we've only given two bursts of ATP, but you can see here, they're a little bit more aggressive. One's 320, one's 310. So we're a little bit more aggressive just by adding this decrementation of 10 milliseconds. So we're trying something different all the time just to try and give the patient the best opportunity. If the first burst of ATP works, then, then fantastic. It doesn't matter what happens next. But um, if it doesn't, then at least you're given some options there to try and uh, help. The other type of ATP is RAMP. And again, this is progressively getting a little bit more aggressive. It's more, more aggressive than your typical burst. Um, again, it's going to be given at a, a program number of pulses uh, and a, at a program rate. But this time, instead of each pulse being the same, they actually decrement by 10 milliseconds. So you can see in this example here, it does its calculations, works out the tachycardia, works out what the ATP should be given at, and it's going to start at 320. But this time it decrements 310, 300, 290, 280. So it's actually getting progressively more aggressive throughout the ramp. Okay. And then the device again redetects. But this time I want to get more aggressive. As I said, there's no point repeating this. So I personally make it a little bit more aggressive and I add an extra pulse. So here it only gave six, but now I'm going to give seven. And again, it's going to decrement 10 milliseconds per pulse. But this time I'm going to give an extra one at 270. And you could have three pulses like this. It may go to an eight pulse at 260. And again, as I said, progressively getting more prog aggressive as I go. So for some Jared, examples you, here. Uh, oh, sorry. Jared, do you find that you use ramp 
much at all? I use it a lot. Uh, it's my go-to. Okay. Yeah, so oh, a, okay. a typical programming for me in a VT zone would be, well, I mean, rate, rate will vary depending on the patient, but yeah. I would typically maybe give three bursts and then three ramps. Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm pretty similar as well, Jared. Yeah, I'm pretty similar. Yeah. Cool. What do you think, yeah, we, uh, we don't tend to. Uh, we'll use redetect and I'll use scan. So that'll decrement between births. It'll yep. shorten, or between trains, it'll shorten it. But I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I've used ramp and they're for more last ditch patients. But that could just be a, you know, like a, a USA versus UK kind of thing as sure. well. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. That's interesting. I'd, I'd like to hear more about your experience with it uh, off call because I, yeah. you know, we yeah. may be something we could add to the. Yeah. Cool. No, definitely. Definitely. And again, as I said, right at the start of the, uh, the conversation tonight, it's, there's no right or wrong. Um, me using ramp or not using ramp versus you not using ramp. Um, as long as we're doing what we believe is the right thing, uh, it can be backed up with evidence. Um, you know, you're not doing anything too crazy then again, yeah, as, long as, can, as long as you can justify your programming. And again, I, I, I kind of hit this home a lot to all the guys that I teach is that, yeah, just as long as you can justify what you've done, then it's usually okay. Mm -hmm. I agree. So a quick example here, we, we can see the patient in a sinus rhythm, goes into a VT, it's giving a, a burst of ATP here, and we can see that it's 230, 230, 230. So even just by looking at the numbers here, you know that this is a burst. You, can, you don't even have to look at how the device is programmed. You can just tell by looking at the rate that this is a fixed rate of 230. So this is probably one burst of ATP. And fortunately, it got him out of the arrhythmia. Another example here, patient in sinus rhythm, goes into a fast tachycardia here. First ATP is given, I think that says 270 again. That's a fixed rate, so we know that's a burst. Now, unfortunately, that fails. Patient remains in VT. It then gets a second burst of ATP, again at 270, which unfortunately fails, but then it also accelerates the VT okay. into VF. Okay at which point then the patient oh. gets a shock. Um, you can ignore the 4.8 joules. That's not very, uh, that's not common treatment, but uh, it, well, either way, it seemed to work in this instance, but uh, typically a 30 or 40 joule shock would follow there. Now, if ATP does fail and you've exhausted all your ATP, then unfortunately the only other option is, is shocks. Um, and the shocks are generated through coils. Okay, so whenever we put an, an ICD lead in, uh, you're going to have coils. Now, in a, in a, what we call a dual coil lead, you're going to have a, an RV coil here in the RV apex, and you'll also have this SVC coil here sitting in the SVC. If it was a single coil uh, lead that you're putting in, then you will not have an SVC coil. You'll just have your RV coil only. Okay. And this is important because it then changes the way you kind of set up the device in the way in terms of the vector of the shock. Okay, because you can give these vectors in, in many different ways. Um, and that can be, I know certainly in, in Medtronic devices, they kind of, you may have seen this when you're programming ICDs is B to X to A. Um, and for those that don't understand it, I'll do my best to explain it now. Basically these letters represent a, a vector and where, where the shock, the vector in which the shock is gonna be dispersed across the heart. So the B, represents the RV coil, okay? I remember that just thinking of the base, you know, um, or, you know, at the bottom. So B for the bottom, it's gonna be the RV coil. The X represents the SVC coil, okay? And then the A is the active can, the actual ICD itself, okay? So in this instance here, a very common, common vector for in a dual coil lead would be, it's gonna go from B, so it's gonna go, the vector of the shock will go from the RV coil and it's going to, going to go towards A and X. So you can see that your vector is almost going to go in this V-shape um, direction, okay, from the RV coil going to A to X, so going to the SVC and the CAN. Uh, perhaps you might turn the CAN off and you're just going to go from B to X, so you're going to go from the RV coil to the SVC coil. Or perhaps you've got a, a single coil only uh, lead or you've opted to turn it off and you therefore you're only going to go from the RV coil to CAN. Um, so there are many different ways to, to program it. This is an example on um, 
Uh, typically, typically this, this is a common in Medtronic again that you may see it where, again, it's represented here. And as I spoke before, I'm always looking at trying to change something, okay, um, for the better, not just because I want to, but, you know, if the first three shocks in this vector failed, then at least try and change maybe the fourth or fifth vector. And you can see here the vectors changed from the previous um, from the previous three. So, you know, the program, will, we may as well try something different. And the other thing to note here is this asterisk, okay? This represents that the SVC call is actually programmed off. Now, perhaps you've done it, um, but devices these days are also quite clever that when you do put a same manufacturing lead into a same manufacturing device, that the device recognizes the lead, uh, especially with your DF4 leads and things like that. So the device will recognize that it is a, uh, an SVC coil, uh, not a single coil perhaps, but it won't necessarily default and turn the coil off. So I always go into uh, here, it's in shared settings, but, and then I always turn the SVC coil off. So although you will still actually see all of the letters, if the AC and asterisks, then that represents that the SVC coil is in fact uh, turned off. So it's just a nice graphical way of seeing that what you've done is, uh, is done. So that's it on the therapy, um, basically, uh, so we've looked at the, um, the way the ICD detects. Uh, we looked at our detection windows. So how are we gonna set the device up? We've looked at our discriminators, uh, what the device is going to use to determine what the arrhythmia is. Um, we've, also, uh, we've also looked at the treatment options that you have, ATP or shocks. And um, I just wanted to finish tonight off's talk with just a little insight into maybe uh, some of you may or may not have seen this, but I highly recommend that every kind of pacing clinic or, and or hospital should have some form of magnet available uh, to them. Uh, magnets can get you out of a lot of trouble sometimes. Um, they can be useful in certain settings. Um, and I don't know if I'm sure if you, for those that have used magnets in the past, I'm sure, you know, it's been very beneficial. Um, but if you use a magnet, basically there's, a magnet can have two effects um, and they, they work differently between a pacemaker and an ICD. So if you were to throw a magnet over a pacemaker, basically you'll put the pacemaker into a fixed mode, uh, a VOO or a DOO. And AJ uh, showed us nicely a few weeks ago what those modes mean. But just in summary, a VOO or a DOO is a non-sensing mode. Essentially, the device will just pace 100% of the time, regardless what the rhythm is. Um, so by placing a magnet over the device, it will put it into this non-sensing mode. So, you know, that's great. Maybe sometimes in cardiac surgery or any type of surgery, if you've just for an acute setting, that if you think you're going to be perhaps using diathermy, that may cause a lot of noise on the device and it's going to then for, um, inhibit pacing, then maybe putting a magnet over it can uh, be very beneficial. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it as your first line of choice. Um, ideally, you should always have some kind of physiologist or a medical representative come into your hospital to either program it uh, properly to a VOO. But in in the uh, you know the acute setting, if it's an emergency, uh, then putting a magnet over is uh, is definitely beneficial. It's also good if maybe a patient has some lead issues, perhaps the lead's broken um, and it's over sensing noise. Again, if you put a magnet over it, then it will just pace and it'll bide you a little bit of time um, so the patient doesn't go asystole. On the flip side with an ICD, um, you know, very rarely, if ever, we want an ICD in DOO or VOO because as I just said, it, it's a sense, it's a non-sensing uh, uh, mode. So if we've got a patient in that and they go into VF or VT, then the device isn't going to sense. So therefore it's not going to ever treat VT or VF. So um, but ways around that is, so yeah, by putting a magnet over ICD, unlike a pacemaker, it would never put it into VOO. But what it does do is it disables therapy. So again, a really, really nice uh, thing to use in the acute setting, perhaps again in theater, there's an emergency and your physician or representative or technician can't program the device, and then perhaps putting an IC, a magnet over the ICD will buy you some time uh, just while you're using diathermy so that, that the ICD doesn't pick up this electrical noise and then give you an appropriate therapy. Um, and just keep in mind that as soon as you remove that device, the magnet, then everything will go back to normal immediately. So there's no long-term effects to the device. But um, 
again, it's just something I just wanted to touch on tonight. Um, and hopefully it may be something that if you do need to use it, then you hopefully you can feel comfortable doing so. And that's it, guys. That's me done. <laughs> hey, Jared, that's awesome. Really quick, sorry. Um, I'm not sure about Medtronic, but just to add for magnet placement on Abbott devices, you want the ring of the magnet over the body of the device, um, just because that's the strongest electrical field, and it will activate the reed switch or the electrical reed switch we've replaced with the old-fashioned one. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you want to make sure not to put it like a target over the device, but the ring of the magnet over the body of the device. And sometimes if they're a very thick patient, you can do two magnets together. We'll increase the electrical or the uh, magnetic right. field. That's good to know. So you, you recommend putting the, the, the ring, the, the hollow part over the body of the device? Yeah, the, the, not like the actual hole. If you put the hole over the middle of the device, there's a chance that you're missing oh. the circuit board. Gotcha. So you want to make sure like the middle of the device it has the ring because a lot of the circuit boards, yep. um, the bottom is usually battery and capacitor and the yes. top is header and the circuit board is just below the header. So oh. you want to put okay. the ring of it, the actual metal part around that part in there. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Oh, fantastic. That was, that was so awesome, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, AJ. I didn't know that actually. That that's really useful. Thank you. Yeah, so um, certainly ask your medical reps. Um, uh, I know I know Medtronic certainly supply them. So um, I I try to have one in every clinic room possible. I usually even try and have one on a crush trolley as well. Um, it, yeah, it, it's it can save you and Brilliant. save the patient as well at times. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank, thank thanks, Jared. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone that, for listening. That was awesome. Yeah, that, that was really, really good. That was really. That was good. fantastic. Thanks, fantastic. Jared. Fantastic. Really thank good. Thanks I've, I've got a, I've got a quick question, which, which um, this is going all the way back to the VT zones. You know, like VT, um, it's probably worth commenting that obviously some VTs can accelerate and decelerate. Not all VT are just like constant um r to r intervals so um you, they can jump up from one zone to another zone and straddle zones which um uh, with whole therapy because it resets the counter just yeah. in case somebody comes across it and you see the vt and then um, it hasn't treated it for that reason sure um, I'll point that out now and that's um and again that's probably something i didn't touch on i'll just see if i can find it and that's something guy I, I another thing I'm not just saying this because AJ's on the line, but again, it's another thing that I, I think Abbott does fantastic. Um, I mentioned here um, that when you set up your VT windows, so if you're using this 18 beat consecutive counter in Medtronic, for example, if you got to the 17th beat and you're one beat away from declaring VT, then if the 18th beat fell outside of that window, then the VT counter starts back to zero, okay? So you imagine if you got the 17 beats one beat away and then it goes, that VT falls out the window, then you're going to have to restart again. So you could be delaying therapy. Um, that's why sometimes the probabilistic counter is quite nice where you say you took a snapshot of 40 beats, you know, this 40 beat snapshot, as long as 30 of those beats are greater than your program rate, then that will not be enough to, uh, to treat. And that's why very with VF, we know that VF, the rate changes a lot, the amplitude of the signal. So it does allow you to have a little bit of dropout, perhaps. Um, but yeah, going back onto the Abbott devices, and again, AJ can back me up here because he knows a lot more than I do, but they use this binning technique, which I think is fantastic, where you could have you could have a device, you could have a rhythm that, yeah, maybe it's a little bit VT and then it falls into this zone. But as long as each beat is kind of filling up these bins gradually, and then whichever bin kind of fills up first, let's so to speak, will go down that decision tree and then give that therapy in that zone. And um, it just prevents any of this kind of issues that when you get to that 17th or 18th beat, if it does drop out, you don't have this resetting of your counter. Therefore, you're not really necessarily delaying therapy. It's good. Excellent. Good. Yeah, that's, that's spot on. I think it's just, you know, uh, I, I appreciate the Abbott shout out. I think that both companies kind of have, you know, different philosophies towards it, yeah. where the binning technique, you know, it may be more likely that you fill the bins and give therapy if you never have a return to sinus. So you're more likely to maybe give therapy versus the Medtronic one. If there's under sensing, you might be like likely to withhold. So they both have their advantages and disadvantages. And I, unfortunately, it's not a perfect way to really 
to solve this problem. And I think it really goes back to what you said. It's, it's all about just customizing it to your patient. Yeah. A lot of times we have secondary prevention. You know, we really have to customize it. Primary prevention, we don't know what their rate is or if they'll even have VT or VF down the road. So you just kind of go with a one size fits all and then troubleshoot later if we, you know, if we see anything adverse event or anything like that. Yeah, exactly, Mike. Excellent. Anyone got any questions for Jared? Yeah, Jared, very good presentation. Thank you very much for the great education this night. Thank you, sir. That's very uh, kind of you. Uh, very great lecture. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, you, first, Daddy. I want to plead, will you be able to share the slides with us in the group so that we can keep reading and internalizing all that you have said today, sir? That is number yeah. one. Um, I want to know what you do in your center. Uh, a patient with an ACD going for surgery and uh, is going to use diatomy. Uh, what is the approach that you use in your center? So we want to learn what you do there. Sure. For example, in my center, what we do is uh, uh, you put uh, um, a defibrillator by the side and uh, you disable the, uh, the ICD by putting a, a magnet on top and uh, the surgery go on, put ECG on that patient and ensure the monitor is on and uh, you'll be able to pick up reading as fast as possible. So we want to learn what you do at your center, sir. Yeah, sure, thank you. First and foremost, I will, yeah, I can more than happy to share the slides. That's not a problem. Um, does does Pace for Life have a, a, an email, email address, address that I should email, email it to? Or is it, I don't know, AJ is quite good with his IT stuff. So I don't know if I can maybe send it to you, AJ. And I don't know if you can get it out to the wider audience. Good. Hey, oh, sorry. If you paste it, Gerard. Yes. You know, if you paste it on the on the cardiac device group, it yes. will reach everybody. Or you send you send it to uh, to AJ or uh, Julius, and he paste it. Mm -hmm. uh, just put it on the cardiac device group. Everybody yeah. will get it. Not a problem, sir. I, I was going to say yeah. um, the presentation has been saved on the iCloud. So um, Joel will send it and then I'll send it to, or Joel will send it um, tonight's okay. presentation to, to the group. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Fantastic, guys. Yeah. But, and I'll, 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 on, I'll, try, and, I'll also try and get a hard copy for you as well. Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, Dr. Daffy, um, so commonly I will, in a, in an organized setting where it's, you know, where, where the surgery is, is planned and, and we can have a physiologist on site, we will always go down to the uh, anesthetic room uh, and see the patient just before going into theater. And we will disable the therapy that way. We will, yeah, essentially turn the therapies off um, yep. and program it. And typically we'll leave the programmer in the theater uh, so that when we need to re-interrogate the device, it, it's there for us. Typically in cardiac surgery, I mean, you're, uh, you're always going to have external defib paddles to use. So very rarely you're in an, it's, mm. you, you need to reactivate the device in an emergency to, um, to deliver therapy. Um, if you're not, if you don't have perhaps internal uh, paddles, then, you know, maybe you're using a defib, maybe an option as well, but um I'm always a little bit nervous about using a magnet as, as my primary go-to, um, you know, as you, you, uh, you physicians know that when you, you know, when you're in the middle of a procedure, the kind of last thing you're thinking about is the magnet. Uh, you're more thinking about the case and that magnet can slip off uh, without yeah. anyone knowing. Um, All right. So my advice would be if you are, if you are going to use a magnet, then tape it down would be my advice. Right. So it doesn't move because they, you know, they're just a little magnet. They can move off. Um, mm. You know, if the patient's, you know, if you're moving the patient around a little bit. So um, that would be my advice is to tape it down. If you are going to use a magnet, um, there is um, yeah, 
but my primary go-to would always be to disable the therapies and um, Best selling. yeah and always be by a phone that if anyone in the cardiac theater at the can call me and i can run straight down and turn the therapies back on if need be but yes disable therapies via a program is my primary alternatively if it's an on-call situation and they want to start surgery without me then yes by all means use a magnet and that is a safe method but just tape it down thank you very much that my second question is uh, you know you talked about a number of um uh, discrimination to assess in each of these uh, devices comparing metronic and uh, saint jude uh, which we have here, many Metroni that we have here. Um, when you look at these uh, different companies, what are the differences in each of these discriminations? And these differences, did they, did they actually matter depending on the company? Yeah, it's a good question. Some of the, some of the discriminators are, are working in the background. They're non-programmable, um, like kind of the the kind of the like the noise discriminator or maybe Medtronic, the T-Wave uh, discriminator, they're kind of just working in the background, non-programmable. So they're either on or off. Um, Medtronic have a have a, a thing called PR Logic um, where it, right. it uses the kind of that, remember those three branches that I spoke about? It, it, PR Logic's really good for kind of, yeah, determining whether A is greater than V or, or V is equal to A. So it's during those scenarios, it's using the PR logic. So it's looking for your atrial flutters. It's looking for your one-to-one -one SVTs. Um, Medtronic have a, a, a Abbott have it slightly different, and I'm sure to, I'm happy to pass this over to AJ, where they they use morphology and um, like an kind of this AVA association um, algorithm, and they also have this kind of if any or if all. So if either of those, and it depends if it's programmed, if it's, if any, as long as one of those algorithms matches, and then it will either go down the decision tree of therapy or non-therapy. But I also have if all, where you would need both of the discriminators to, to match up, to give the appropriate therapy. Yeah, Good. no, uh, there's also two out of three you can do as well. Um, and there's some advanced algorithms like VFTA, you may come across Dr. Dafe and the Gallant devices. Um, I'll tell you on the side later, but we've been considering leaving VFTA off for okay. initial implants because if the device, if the lead comes loose, there's a chance that it could far field oversense and it could give therapy when it shouldn't. So it's a really great algorithm, but I think that that one should be off an implant. Um, so there's like specific things, but I think in general, and Jared, you may agree with me that all the companies are trying to solve the same problem that a human being is trying to solve when they're addressing an arrhythmia, right? So we're looking at, is it a stable rhythm? Is it a sudden onset? So we all kind of share the same discriminators. It's just kind of different ways of approaching the same problem. Mm. But just like a human being, when they look at an arrhythmia, what's occurring, that's all the device is doing. It's just, as you said, it's, it's a very simple, smart device. So it's dumb, but it knows what it knows. And it's our responsibility to program what it sees so it acts appropriately. So anytime these devices are acting the wrong way, it's probably because they're seeing the wrong thing or we haven't appropriately programmed it. Yeah, spot on. Okay, Jerry, let me take you back to Africa where we practice. Fantastic. Yeah, you take you implant a device for a patient and set the device and after that the patient travel miles away in a different town. And one of the night, at 11 p.m. in the night, you receive a call from that city that this patient is having a frequent shock from the device. And you know, the distance from that city to where you are is like four hours to reach you. And it's in the night, the patient can't get to you because of one, uh, you have bad roads, uh, two, you have insecurity in traveling in the middle uh, of the night, and neither you'll be able to go through that journey because of what you suspect as insecurity to get to that point. Sure. So um, the cardiologist that is, uh, on, on, uh, that is seeing the patient doesn't have a programmer there, doesn't have, uh, the only thing the cardiologist can do is to offer medication 
and the patient is on a monitor at the cardiology um, um, emergency uh, uh, hospital and uh, emergency room and be able and is telling you there is uh, there is um, ventricular tachycardia, the device shock, the patient returns and returns back again. What will you do at this point, sir? It's a, it's a really it's a because really this is a live case I'm sharing. Yeah, with yeah you. and that's it, and and that's it's a beautiful eye opener. It really is because I guess in Europe and the US, um, you know, we're, we're we're spoiled. I guess um, yeah, everything's at our fingertips, so it's easy it's easy for us to forget, kind of you know, in places like Africa, how how different things are. So uh, we yeah, certainly I need to open my mind up to that. And um, but first and foremost. The, in that setting, it's really, it is really difficult. I think you can only, first and foremost, you've got to determine is the reason the patient getting a shock appropriate or inappropriate? So, and that takes skill. Um, you've got to have a programmer. You've got to know what you're looking for. Um, on the flip side, it may just take an ECG. Now, if your ECG is showing VT or VF and the patient's getting multiple shocks, then yes, all you can possibly do is, you know, get IV access and give the right drugs. Um, and if you've got the luxury of a, a programmer, uh, I mean, the thing is with a programmer, if, if it's genuine VT or VF, then, and you know that, then really it's medical management. Um, you don't want to disable therapies because you want the patient to be treated, but it really is going to take medical management on your behalf to try and stabilize the patient. The difficult one is in your Oof. setting is that if it is inappropriate, if you maybe look at the ECG and go, well, the patient's getting shocks, but they're well, they're talking to me, their ECG shows sinus rhythm. Then you've got to think, well, maybe this is inappropriate. Perhaps there's a loose header. Perhaps there's a fracture in the lead. Um, so this is when your magnet might be a really good example that you just- Good example, yeah. You know, the patient's sitting there in A&E &E and you go, right, this looks inappropriate to me, so I'm going to put a magnet over it. Um, and really, in that setting, that's the only two things I can really think of. Perhaps some input from anyone else, perhaps, if they've got... No, ideas. that's, I think, that's yeah. spot on. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that you might want to consider sending magnets with some of these rural patients, yeah. so at least they have exactly. some way of addressing yeah, it. Exactly. Uh, medical magnets are relatively cheap, and I'm sure suppliers are happy to get them, so... It could be a matter of them getting shocked 40 times inadvertently when they don't need it. So. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And it's, the, right. I guess, the skill in that is just knowing when to use the magnet. And, um, and really, a simple ECG, looking at your patient. Again, if your patient's hemodynamically compromised, the chances are it's an arrhythmia. If they're sitting up talking to you and ECG, SATs, blood pressure's all normal, and they're getting shocks, then you've got to go down the route of being inappropriate. So a magnet in that setting is, is the right choice. Yeah, but I and uh, we could treat the underlying cause. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Does that help, Doctor Adafi? Well, maybe he's dropped off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe he didn't like your answer. Help, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, that's good. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mister Gerard, for your um, your lecture. Very, very. Uh, it's quite um, insightful. Thank you. I really picked up a lot from it. And your answer to Dr. Duffy's question, I think that's the best we could afford to do in our setting. Sure. Um, at least with the ECG, uh, most, uh, but, uh, most especially continuous ECG, you get to see if it's a sinus rhythm. And, and um, if the patient is getting sure, of course, it's most likely an inappropriate sure. And put, applying a, a, a a magnet over it would uh, terminate the therapies. Then at least that should suffice for some time, pending when a program is actually able to do the yeah. right thing. So I think your your answer is um, spot on, and thanks a lot. Anytime, mate. Anytime. Uh, I do have a question though. Um, in the course of your lecture, you mentioned about you talked about um, wavelets or morphology rather um, that you usually um, during follow-up, you check, you check, you do a check on the, that you acquire a new template um, each time during follow-up. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to ask something about that, but you, you mentioned it already during your, your uh, the lecture. So, um, but while you're doing that, do you sometimes, well, due to our settings, sometimes 
although Mr. Julius would always uh, <laughs> would always advise I do so. Um, sometimes you don't have um, access to maybe a continuous ECG. Uh, in some cases, not as if it's not available, but sometimes there's some constraints, and uh, you might not the patient might not be connected to uh, a continuous ECG, or there's some noise on the programmer, and it's not very clear sometimes not all the time anyway so but why you acquiring the template i guess you also correlating with the ecg to be sure that the template you're acquiring at that point uh close to normal or normal i guess yeah. i'm right yeah okay. exactly and the thing with the thing with morphologies you yes it, it's good practice to have an ecg because you can relate it to sinus rhythm you can go yep okay there's a change in qrs morphology from a pace morphology to sinus but even with an out ecg remember the, the device isn't using a 12 lead ecg to determine what's happening it's it's using the uh the pace sense lead or well, in this case the far field so regardless even if you had an ecg or not you could even just look at your uh, EGMs, your atrial and ventricular EGM and use your markers. If it's saying A sense, V sense, then you know the patient's in sinus rhythm. Um, because yeah, you can quite comfortably do that without a 12 lead ECG. A 12 lead ECG is just really just for, for well, yeah, it brings nothing to the party to be honest. Um, so hopefully answering your question, it's um, yeah, the reason I do it is it, there's no harm in doing it. Um, I like to update it. Um, as I said, things change all the time, um, yeah. and that could cause a change in what the uh, intrinsic uh, EGM looks like. Um, and as I say, most devices have automatic updates anyway. Um, obviously, with heart block patients, you're limited. You can't do it in a complete heart block patient. So I, my advice would be to turn off the uh, automatic uh, EGM update on those patients. Um, but, yeah, in the other patients that can handle it, then, yeah, just do it. it the benefits are there there's no harm in doing it but you you know the benefits are quite good and the good thing about it is when you do do it for a brief 10 15 seconds it actually gives you the template scores for those for that egm as well so as soon as you do it you'll start seeing your counters going 98 percent, 95 percent. if you do it and realize that the perhaps the percentage matches is down to 70 or 80 and you go oh that's really bad at least you're there at least you're there to to do it again and again and again and constantly update that template until you get kind of good match scores. Excellent. Fantastic, um, Jared. Um, I always encourage um, Elvis to put monitoring ECG on. And just like you said, just to compare. Yeah, when you, 100%. Obviously taking the template from the EGM. Yep. So um, back when you and um, EJ were talking about um, some when what, what happens if there are um, different um, QRS morphologies, Mm. you know you do come across that yeah. um so with obviously medtronic when if it collects um if it find a struggle if, if it's struggling to collect like a template because of the variations in the morphology if you get monitoring ecd you can actually say ah i yeah. can see the qrs changing exactly that's why it might, be, it might be by gemini or trigemini for example or Spot on. Spot on. atrial ectopics with bundle branch block yeah you're 100 percent right and that's where your ecg can support you Yes, um, yeah so definitely but um and in that instance if that's the case then you know you've got to look at mate well you got to then question whether wavelet is, wavelet right is the, the best yeah. yeah yeah spot on yeah okay okay so thanks a lot pleasure uh, Anytime, mate. i also have another question fantastic. i don't know i just want to know you what's your opinion about this uh um discriminator the one-to-one -one svt the other one-to-one -one svt it's advised that you may perhaps turn it off during implant, but um, to turn it on uh, three months after or yeah. when the lead is yeah. stable. Exactly. Do you do that often or it's it contributes? What's, what's your yeah. take on that? I always, I always turn it off um, for that. Um, and I turn it on usually probably at the six week check. Uh, we, again, things might be different in your center, but after an yeah. implant, we typically see a patient anywhere between four to six weeks. Uh, post implant at that point i'm dropping my thresholds down i'm turning my one-to-one -one svt discriminator on and the reason i do that is because you're at risk if the atrial lead displaces into the ventricle okay so that means you've got an atrial lead in the ventricle 
So that means the atrial lead is picking up ventricular signals as well as the ventricular lead picking up ventricular signals. Now, in isolation, that's not a problem. Um, it's not ideal, but it's not a problem. What is the problem is, is that if the patient goes into VT, you've got VT going along on your RV lead, which is, yeah, great. But what's happening is that the atrial lead is also picking up the ventricular signal, remember? So the atrial lead is also gonna look like VT. So the device will think, oh, well, this is a, the atrial rate and the ventricular rate are the same. And so, it, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So therefore I think that this is a one-to-one -one atrial tachycardia. Um, and it may therefore uh, withhold therapy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that, spot on, Jared. Um, Medtronic recommend is it 130 days? Well, like, that long. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm a bit generous with six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly with you. Yeah, put it on later on. Yeah. Some people some people leave it off completely all the time. Yeah, yeah, um, like yeah. that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And again, it, like I say, there's no right or wrong. If you can justify it, then all for it. Fantastic. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'll bring a it very to great place. lecture. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate ah, it. I really enjoyed the lecture so much. Oh, that's good I to know. So much from it. Yes, Fantastic. sir. Anytime. Well, yeah. great, 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 great. Any questions outside of this? If uh, feel free to drop a message on the on the chat group or whatever, and uh, reach out, and I'm um, hopefully I can answer them. Brilliant. Fantastic, Jared. That was again. Congratulations. Thank you for doing this Thank for you. us. Pleasure, man. That's really, really good. Um, so net, this is going to be available um, later on. I think Joel is going to send it to the group. So um, yeah, it's going to be available for everyone to revisit it and keep looking at it. And you know, um, Dr. Daffy, Elvis, and all everyone, including um, the trainees at my hospital as well. This would be really, really useful for them. Um, Very useful. This was really, really good. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent lesson. Thank you again, Jared. And I'll just remind you guys that so next week um, is going to be myself um, talking about um, VT and um, differential diagnosis VT. Um, this is mostly ECG um, and uh, different VT and SVT. And then um, maybe even talk about the mechanisms of VT, which, you know, sort of goes into what some of what Jared spoke about, you know, like zone, yes. zone or straddling, you know, how VT accelerates and decelerates and things like that. Um, and then I think um, Jared, my, um, Jared is going to carry on from what he was doing last week. Um, and I was in here for that, but he said he's going to carry on and then sort of delve into um, um, EGM as well, discriminating, you know, VT, AVN, RT, SVTs and things like that. On each Good. Other. That's gonna, yeah. So next next Sunday, hopefully, I'll do um, twelve lead ECG and differential diagnosis of that, which is which is good to know for you guys. Yes, sir. I want to know, actually. Yes, so sir. Really, really good. Um, thank so you yeah, very much again, Jared. That that was fantastic. Thank you, Jared. Really, thank really you, good. Jared. Very kind. Yes, very kind. Thank you, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Yeah, have a have a good night. Have a good week. Doctor, yeah, I'm we are great. How are you? <laughs> yeah, fine. Fantastic good. lecture. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank great you, sir. Yeah. Doctor, Doctor Joma was here. I think I saw her here. Doctor Joma, um, Ekero. She's an electrophysiology in the US. She was she was she was with us. I don't know whether she has left. Oh, um, I think um, Dr. Oladjimeje Ola has got his hair. Can you please speak then, Doctor? Yeah, thank you. Have you got a question? Yes, Dr. Ola, please. how are you? Yeah, good evening, bro. It's good to hear your voice. Sir. Yeah, well Thanks done. for this great group. I yeah. just want to ask a quick question, please. Um, I remember when you was um, discussing around therapy, when you're trying to um, give the therapy shocks, he talked about um, the SVC coil, which determines the vector of the shock, the, the vector direction of the shock. In the programmer where he gave the SVC coil being plugged, uh, as in SVC coil off, 
but the code still showed the X, which I guess it represented as the SBC coil. So is there any reason why the X should still be showing if the SBC coil is already switched off? That's my first question. And number two, second question is that why do you need to change the vector when programming for the shocks? Because you program a AX to B, yeah. B to AX. Is there yeah. any reason why you prog we program the vectors yeah, sure. while delivering the third or fourth shock? Thanks, 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 thanks for your questions. They're great. Um, to answer your first one, the the when you turn the SVC coil off, you're right. The the letter doesn't disappear. That that's just a manufacturing thing. Uh, that's nothing. Uh, that's nothing that you've done wrong or anything like that. But it is represented by that little asterisk. So as long as you see that asterisk, you know that the SVC coil is off. Um, and as I said, it's just a manufacturing thing. They decide that they don't turn it off um, for whatever reason. So unfortunately, we have no control over that. But as long as you see that asterisk, that is reassurance for you when you either print out your paperwork or just looking at the um, this, uh, looking at the vectors that you know your SVC call is off. So um, hopefully that answers that. To answer your second question, the reason the reason I changed the vector is a bit like why I kind of do anything when I program an ICD. It's 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 always trying something. I'm trying to try something different. Um, there's no point doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same result. We all know that what that means. And um, so if the third shock from going to B to A doesn't work or B to X to A doesn't work, then at some point I've got to think, well, perhaps maybe if I reverse the vector, uh, I might get a bigger wave front because it's by phasic. I might get a bit of weight, bigger wave front going in the other direction. It may work. Um, I haven't looked into, you know, the research behind it, um, but in my in my eyes, it's it's like you've got to try something. Um, if you're getting it towards the end of your shocks, there's no harm in trying something different, and it may just be enough to revert the therapy, uh, to revert, revert the arrhythmia. But to to answer to put it in a scientific uh, terminology, I, I can't. I apologise, and um, but certainly it's for me, it's just a case of trying something different. Yeah, that that's spot on, Jared. That that's the recommendation in 2019 by the um, Heart Rhythm Society yeah. and European regulatory heart rhythm regulatory um, bodies that you do sh change the shock vector mm. on um, an old metronic, like the penultimate um, shock vector, change it, or even the one before that, like you said, mm. um, try something different. And sure. that's, that's the guidelines that they're recommending that you do. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, any more question? So in the absence of question, so we wait the great next week lecture from uh, uh, Mr. Julius, uh, Mr. Gerard and AJ. Thank you very much, Gerard, Julius, for for the great work you have done today. We have learned so much, so much. You simplify it. No. This were Greek to us. Now we can understand them in English now. Yeah. Thank you very <laughs> much, sir. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, honestly, Jara, that was really good. That yes. was really good. Very Before that really this was. lecture, they were sounding like Greek to us. Yeah. Now they are now in written in English. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, um, AJ, you AJ said to pass on that. Uh, that was really good as well. And he's had to, he's had to hop off. No, really. uh, but he, he said it was fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah. Uh, That's well. very kind. So, yeah. You're all very, you're very kind. And thanks, thanks for taking the time out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Have a great, yeah. great rest of your night. Yeah. Have, have a good Yeah. Day. Good night, everybody. Have a great day. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.